Hello, Internet. My name is Effie, and you're watching... No, we're not watching. Um, yeah, let's start. Let's start this over. <laughs> uh, mm, great start already, I can tell. You know, I'm kind of nervous for this. Also, I just realized I don't have my script pulled up. Hello, Internet. My name is Effie, and this is The Human Condition. So basically, this is an introduction to this podcast where you get to learn all about me and this podcast. So hopefully that's okay with you, because here we are. So what is the human condition, and why should you care? In essence, the human condition is the name that is given to the things that we as humans experience. And these experiences are not just what make us human, like us, you and me, us, but they're what make everybody human. Things like love, loss, hatred, loneliness, jealousy. We all deal with these things, and even if we don't personally deal with everything under the umbrella of the human condition, at least we can empathize with it. Or at least I'm hoping so, and I'm not just screaming into the void. The human condition is a term that you might grow in at, one that most English teachers wet themselves over. Something that you had reiterated to you over and over again, showcased with examples of Shakespeare, Steinbeck, some other white guy that wrote literature. Also, that wasn't a joke. I literally just couldn't think of anyone else. Or you might have literally never heard of the term before, which, if you haven't, congrats. You made it out alive. And who am I? I'm Effie. I'm 22. I live in Colorado where, yes, I can smoke weed. I can order it online, actually, right now if I wanted to. I'm Japanese American and I was adopted. So originally I am Filipina, Chinese, and Japanese. I am very much an Asian woman in blood and name and nature. I work too hard, don't know how to relax, and have a special obsession with what other people think of me. My only caveat is that sometimes I swear way too much, which is not very Asian of me. Sorry, Mom. Also, sorry about that tattoo I got two days ago and still haven't told you about. We'll get there. It's a process. And sorry to you, listener, that has to listen to my vulgarities. I was classically trained as a pianist, took vocal lessons starting from... When I was 10, I took acoustic guitar when I turned 14. I also just recently learned the ukulele. You know, never too old to start something new, even though I'm not that old, but I feel old. We're not going to talk about that. I like to write sad songs in my bedroom about men that have hurt me, one of my hobbies. I'm also a writer, like how I'm writing this right now, another one of my hobbies. The rest include overthinking, starting projects I may or may not finish, and buying things I don't need. My mother is a retired education teacher, and my dad is dead. I lived with my boyfriend for three years and are two cats. By day, I'm a barista, and by night, I'm also a barista. It just kind of depends on the work schedule. I used to be an assistant teacher, and I also used to teach at a preschool. I... Uh, I love teaching. I quit to pursue my dreams of making low-production YouTube videos, music recorded on my phone, and this podcast. So you're welcome. I fear both failure and success, so the internet is like the perfect place to stay stuck. If you have heard my voice before, I'm sorry, but it might be because I do YouTube under the name F-E, spelled E-P-H-I-E, because I'm just way too cool to spell my name normally. I've also been on another podcast, which is way cooler than mine, called Awkward Segway, created by one of my best friends, Connor Adams. So if you haven't heard of it before, you have now, and you have no excuse not to check it out. I drink way too much coffee, and sometimes in general, I just drink way too much. I also don't get hangovers, so vent drinking is like my superpower. 
It is a bad one and very enabling, but like, hey, I'll take it. I am very competitive, but I'm not a perfectionist, which weird paradox. Like last week, I was playing Settlers of Catan with my friends, a game where conquest is the goal. And I had the best resources. I made people pay me taxes to use my ports because I have two of them. You might not know what I'm talking about if you're not a nerd and you don't play games with your friends on the weekends. But if you do, you know, the whole spiel. I Obviously, I won. And then I went home and I didn't put my shoes away. Didn't close any of the drawers. Didn't put my clothes in the hamper. Leo, who is my significant other, says I'm one of those messy artsy types that he quote unquote, usually tries to avoid at all costs. My boyfriend and I, we are both massive hipsters. And I mean that in like the most millennial way possible or the way that boomers would describe millennials. I am not a millennial, by the way. I am a Gen Z or a Gen Zer, a, a Zen. Uh, yeah, whatever. I'm one of those. Which may surprise some of you, but we are older than you probably think. Anyways, that's not the point of this. The point is, Elle and I are like super hipsters. The hipsteriest hipsters. I border somewhere on the line between casual goth and some sort of punk-inspired Asian streetwear, and Leo loves bomber jackets and joggers and has one of those haircuts where the sides are faded, but the middle is almost long enough that you could put it into a little ponytail. One of those. We went to Atlanta once, and people looked at us often because we obviously didn't belong there. Elle and I met when we were kids, like the fourth grade. We had the same teacher. That year, I buried him in rocks. A very romantic start to our love story. Obviously, we're a perfect match. Personally, I love the human condition as a concept. I first learned about it my sophomore year of high school, reading a separate piece, a really weird book about boys in boarding school during World War II. It was a book that I never actually finished because after my freshman year of high school, I didn't actually finish any of the books that were assigned to me. And my best friend, who is no longer my best friend, fell in love with one of the main characters. She was boy crazy. I was not. (laughs) My sophomore year for me was kind of like a hard time and a hard time. It was my first year of recovery from a debilitating mental illness that I didn't know I had and that I'm still not fully recovered from. I didn't really have great friends. All my relationships were that really petty on again, off again, high school, surface level, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I was in kind of a dead end, toxic, very codependent relationship that later ended that year, which At that time, it was world-ending, you know? That's why the concept of the human condition was so intriguing to me. I didn't understand really the weight of it or the gravity of being connected to other people, to everyone on a fundamental level, as I don't think most people do. But I like the idea of other humans, humans 50, 60, 600 years ago, people that fought the Crusades, people that wrote award-winning novels, people that invented toaster strudel, having the same struggles as I did. Being a teenager was lonely, and knowing that your struggles are just human, that was powerful. All right. Well, am I boring you yet? Because I have been talking for a very long time about myself and the human condition, but I really hope I'm not I know learning about some 20-something that's obviously a hot mess might not be very interesting, or it could be your thing, and you just didn't know it yet. I do know, though, that catching up in the lore that is Effie is like reading the prequel to a story that you wanted to see, so I think instead for the rest of this time with you guys, I'm just going to tell you a story. My life has a lot of places that are divided into befores and afters. I think everyone says, like before you hit puberty and after you hit puberty, or before you first fell in love and after you got your heart broken, before you realized that the world was a dark, scary place and after you made your peace with it. 
Although usually that last one happens slowly. I trickle one shady thing after another before you just kind of realize that that might be how it is. My before and after is a before and after of loss. Before dad died and after dad died. But it was so much more than that. It was before I realized that death wasn't just a phenomenon in movies and after I realized that the universe could just take whatever it wanted from you at any age and it didn't matter how you felt or what you needed. Before I had a broken family and after living with the realization that life wasn't going to be as easy as it should have been. Before losing my blissful, blissful ignorance, that sweet taste of childhood. And after realizing that my childhood was cut short and that was it, nothing I could do about it. Before realizing that suicide wasn't just a word and after knowing that if you really wanted to, you could just be done, leave and never come back. And that was scary for a child at 11 years old who had lived a pretty cushy life before then, I was shook. And I do mean that in the colloquialized way as seriously as I can. Like, remember guys, I'm a filthy Gen Z adult. I use scary words from the new age. But I was shocked. I was shaken to the core. I was... In my, in my writing, I wrote Bikuri Desune, which is surprised in Japanese. So like, yeah, whatever, I'll just leave it in there. I was Bikuri Desune. I was, in the worst way, shook. See, this is a story I've told like a hundred times. In the dedication of the book about rocks I had to write in the sixth grade. And yeah, in the dedication. I don't know, don't ask me. In the memoir assignment for short story prompt and creative writing. And again, freshman composition. In the writing I did on my free time, which I did often because I was a massive nerd. And I didn't really like the concept of having friends. Which, side note. If anyone from high school is listening, which I doubt, but if you are, I'm sorry that I held friendships worse than I held water. I wrote about this story in more high school, middle school memoir speeches, which I don't know about you, but I have no idea why I had so many memoir like writing assignments because what 16 year old has anything interesting to write about other than childhood trauma? But I digress. I have told the story many times, but I will tell it again, one more time, just for you. And, like, not anyone else listening, just you. You know who you are. I was 11 when my father committed suicide. I don't remember the details as vividly as I did the first 20 times I wrote the story down, but I'll try. It was February 13th, um, the day before Valentine's Day. It was snowing and it was cold. I remember that. I don't remember what I wore, but I do remember that day I had an orthodontist appointment and I was probably late or like dilly-dallying, not getting up, something like that, because that's how it usually was. My mother was probably yelling at me to hurry up because we we're going to be late, even though if we were late, it'd probably be her fault because she's always late. Um, now, 11 years later, I'm always on time, so I guess the yelling worked. Thanks, Mom. I remember at the time we had that really ugly Honda Odyssey van, which I can say now growing up to be a car person. Other than that, I don't remember anything else. I went to the orthodontist, being the one child that was gifted braces in, like, the fourth grade. Uh, I got them tightened, or whatever they do there. It's been a long time. And then I went home. I remember getting home and my mom couldn't find my dad, but his car was still in the garage. I remember the weather was kind of gloomy, but I just sat on the couch and watched TV or something. Now looking back, I can see that scene vividly. I can see the dim room, the way the kitchen used to look. At the time, nothing felt wrong, but I can't, I can't revisit that scene in my head without feeling sick feeling dread, feeling that sick, sick feeling of dread in the pit of my stomach. Because I know what happens next, and 11-year-old me, she didn't, and I feel sorry for her. 
I remember my best friend's dad came over, my best friend Nato, um, because it had been a while and we still couldn't find my dad. I don't know how long it was from when I got home to when they came over. I don't know if it was minutes or hours. I remember being a little bit worried, but I didn't really think anything life-shattering would happen. I don't think people usually do. For some reason, I'd always suffered from anxiety. I remember waking up at like six or seven years old, sleeping in my parents' room, which I did for years because I was a nervous child, and not seeing one of my parents and being scared or thinking the worst my seven-year-old mind could think of. But that day, I didn't have that anxiety. I don't know why, but I am grateful for that peace that I had right until the end. I vividly remember that I was on my laptop, probably for a while. In my head, I can see the way that laptop charger cord crosses the entire couch into the laptop in front of me, and I don't know why, but I hate that mental image. Other than that, I remember nothing until a policeman came to the house. I don't know if I was worried at that point, but I remember it was the afternoon. It was dark in the basement. In my head, all of the lights are off. I don't know if they were, but that's how I see it in my mind. I remember my best friend's dad told me, and I remember what he said and how he said it. He said, your dad is dead and that was it. After that, I don't know. Everything is fragmented, and there are bits and pieces missing. I remember that my mom's old pastor came over, one that she hadn't talked to for years, but he was still here when she called, and I know she's grateful for that. I remember that my best friend and I stayed in the guest room because my room didn't have a TV, and the coroners needed to take his body away, so they needed to keep us occupied, like you do with children. Luckily, neither my mom or I had to find my dad or see his corpse. Um, I remember a lot of people coming over at night, although I don't know if that was the next day or the same day. I remember a family friend of ours looking at me and telling me that he wouldn't have done it if it weren't for the medication, and I remember not knowing what that meant. I remember learning that he hanged himself in our shed. I never got close to it again, but we did have to stay in that house until I was 18. Days before his suicide, I vividly remember one morning where he was sleeping on the couch. He had just gotten shoulder surgery and was on opioids. And I think that's what people meant when they said that he wouldn't have done it if it wasn't for the medication. I can't recall if someone said that he was taking more than prescribed, or if it was a rumor, or something that my adult brain is making up, but I do remember there was one morning where I was practicing piano, like I always had to, and there was a cockroach or something under my piano, and I screeched. You know, like that girl screech where you just kind of point and back away. Yeah, one of those. And my dad, he shushed me. He closed his eyes and he went back to sleep. And it was weird because he never did that because it was apparent to me that his mission was to protect me. And I don't know if that was a sign, but maybe. And I know before he committed suicide, there was an open investigation on him where he got arrested or was going to get arrested. I, n I don't know. I'm not sure the specifics, but he was accused and charged of assaulting a young girl at a youth group party. And I know I didn't know it at the time that he was accused or that he was talking to the police. But I was told after. People are very honest with me, and I am grateful for that. I know also that the pastor of the new church we were going to, my dad called for solace the day he died, and the pastor told him to just confess. I don't know if my dad was guilty. I don't know what pushed him over the edge. I don't know what was going through his mind. I And I... 
I never will. I will never know the truth, and I will never know the answers. And I have made peace with that fact, mostly. I have never felt restless for closure. I have never felt like his suicide was my fault or that I was a burden. Truth be told, his suicide is not something that I think of every day. He is someone I grieve, but along with him, I also grieve my childhood. I grieve for the loss of the girl that I was and who I could have been if things were different. And now being older, I realize that there's the before and the after and more things that I thought at first. The before, thinking that my parents were infallible, and after, knowing more about life and about him and about the situation involving his death, that my parents, the ones that were supposed to have it all figured out, were painfully human. And that is scary, knowing that broken people are bringing people into the world and not knowing what they're doing and doing things other than being parents but that they're people with lives and flaws. It was scary then, learning it as a child, and it's scary now as an adult. Personally, I don't plan on bringing kids into the world or raising any for myself, but if I did, even the thought that me, who was so troubled with such a long history of making bad decisions, had the responsibility of raising a human and having the possibility to royally fuck the kid up, and maybe at the same time thinking that everything I'm doing is the right thing, that is scary. It's terrifying, and maybe it's just a product of my life and the biases it has handed me, but realizing that your parents are human, and that you are human, and you have the same capabilities as your parents, is terrifying. So, that's where I am right now. I don't know if it's a good place or a bad place, but right now, this is where the story stays. And see, the story isn't over yet, because I'm here to tell it, and I'm here to live it, and so is my mom, and so is my dad's family, and so is my boyfriend, who has never met him, but has to live with me, and all the things that have made me... me. And I don't think it's a bad thing, or a good thing, that what happened, happened. What happened just is. I will continue to live my life with the before and afters that I have already experienced, and all the ones that will happen in the future. And I hope that the journey is beautiful, and peaceful, and challenging, and intense. I hope to fully embrace my human condition, good and bad, befores and afters all the love and the hate and the hurt that life throws at me and I hope that that is enough well thank you for listening to my story I hope it wasn't too boring or too sad or too sarcastic I can be either or all three simultaneously sometimes if you like this episode I have 12 more planned for this season and good news they're not all about me Although, I do have this burning need to talk about my trauma and exploitative story form, so obviously I'll be here. Also, it is my podcast, so I might stick around for a while. If you want to see updates on what this podcast is up to and the people that come on here with better stories and more interesting lives than mine, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and even Facebook, all under the name The Human Pods. So it's that little at sign with the Human Pods, spelled T H E H U M A N P O D S, but you're smart, so you probably already figured that out. If you want to see more of me, which I don't know why you would, but if you want to, go for it. You can follow me on all the social medias at ephemerality, spelled with an I, so that's like the little circle at thing, and then E P H E M E R A L I T I. So it's basically like ephemerality, but instead of a Y at the end, it's an I. Very creative and artsy, I know. If you do follow me, though, it becomes very apparent, both on Twitter and Instagram, that yes, I am a young 20-something, 
that unironically uses words like lit and stan and posts too many selfies with my cats and drinks too much. I will be back next week with an episode so cool you'll forget all the dumb things I said this time around. If you made it this far, thank you for listening to this podcast, and this has been The Human Condition. I hope you have a great day, and it's lit, fam. Just kidding. Uh, I do hope you had a great day, though.